Hello friends, it's good to be back with you again. It's been a little while. Um, firstly, we'd like to thank the folks at uh, First Baptist on Main Street here in Bennington for the use of their beautiful sanctuary uh, for our service. This is a Thanksgiving service. We're going into that season of thanks. And we want to pause at this time to remember all of God's many, many blessings. At this time, Charlie Marshall will uh, bring us our gathering song. At this time, if you'd be in an attitude of prayer, we will bring to you our opening prayer. O oh, gracious God, we give you thanks for your abundant, overflowing, loving generosity to us. Thank you for the blessings of the food, family, and friends, especially for the presence of those gathered here this Thanksgiving Sunday. Thank you for our health, our work, and our play. Thank you for the four-century-long heritage of faith and freedom that we enjoy in this land of ours. We especially thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As we pause to return thanks, we remember all those who are hungry, alone, sick and suffering, war and violence. Open our hearts to your love. We ask for your peace and presence through Christ our Lord. Amen. And our first hymn is Come Ye Thankful People Come. I'd like to share with you a poem for Thanksgiving entitled Because of Thy Great Bounty by Grace Crowell. It was written in 1936. Because I have been given much, I too must give. Because of thy great bounty, Lord, each day I live. I shall divide my gifts from thee with every brother that I see who has the need of help from me. Because I have been sheltered, fed by thy good care, I cannot see another's lack, and I not share. My glowing fire, my loaf of bread, my roof save shelter overhead, that he too may be comforted. Because love has been lavished upon me so, Lord, a wealth I know that was not meant for me to hoard, I shall give love to those in need, shall show that love by word and deed. Thus shall my thanks be thanks indeed. We are indeed called, even in a season of thanks, to not only return thanks, but to share as well. 
Our next hymn is We Gather Together to Ask the Lord's Blessing. As we come to that time of our service when we want to pray, um, I would urge you, I'm going to pause, we're going to have a moment of, of prayerful contemplation, and during that time, please offer up to the Lord anything that might be on your hearts, either in gratitude and praise or in concern, and uh, then we will conclude with the words that our Savior taught us. And as we go into prayer, we remember in this season when we celebrate abundance that God has abundantly blessed us and prayerfully consider how you may return to him a worthy portion of your time, your talent, and your treasures. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for each and every blessing that you have given us. So many, Lord, that it's difficult to even to begin to count. We thank you for the blessing of family and of friends we thank you for full tables. We thank you for food and clothing and shelter. These are what we think of as everyday blessings, but nevertheless, Lord, we are well aware that there are many who do not have even a portion of those great blessings you've given us. Lord, may we return to you a worthy portion of all you've given us so that others may know of your love and your concern for them. We want to pray, Lord, for this church, First Baptist, in gratitude for their kindness in letting us be here today. We want to thank you for the Shaftesbury Methodist Church, Lord, and for all of the churches of our community. We just pray, God, that uh, all of us will show the love that you have for us to those around us. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. Gracious God, we are aware that at this time there are many who served in our military who are far from home at this time. They will not be gathering with family. They will not see friends. And we just pray that you'll be with them. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for their service. We want to pray for our nation and our world. It's a very troubled world. There are many areas that are still racked with violence, hunger, war. We just pray, God, that the spirit of the Prince of Peace will come into those dark corners of the world and illuminate that world. We pray, Lord, for unity among our people and, and understanding and kindness. We pray, Lord, for open hands and not clenched fists. We pray, Lord, for hearts that give, lives that serve. And Lord, we now pause to Lift up those things which are in our hearts at this time. And we commit these cares, concerns, praises, and celebrations to you through Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a tradition in our church to do a responsive reading from Psalms, the Psalter, and today it's going to be Psalm 85. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, that would be great. And at this time, Sue is coming forward to share that with us. Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God will speak, for the Lord will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to the Lord in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear the Lord, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before the Lord and make God's footsteps away. And now um, I have the scripture readings from the Old Testament, a reading from Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 to 24. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out, as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among the scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the waters and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down in peace, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost. And I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. As for you, my flock, says the Lord, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, and between rams and goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the rest of the pasture? When you drink of clear water, must you foul the rest with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have fouled with your feet? Therefore, says the Lord God to them, I myself, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you sh scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd my servant David, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. 
I, the Lord, have spoken. And from the New Testament, a reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks to you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the Lord of, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all ways. And from the gospel today, a reading from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Jesus looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not believe them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks to you, Lord Jesus. Let's uh, turn to God in prayer at this time. Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts, wherever we may be at this moment, be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is indeed a time of thanksgiving, and uh, uh, the theme of today's message is a life of thankfulness. And as we continue through the season, we take time to count our blessings. And as we do so, we pause to return thanks for each and every one of those blessings that we enjoy. And you know, in spite of all the challenges that we face during these times we are living in, we still have so much to be thankful for, don't we? And so we're going to focus on that wonderful theme of thankfulness. Like that childhood hymn, we want to stop and count our blessings and we want to name them one by one and be amazed at what God has done. Because God indeed has done very much and we are thankful for food, for clothing, for shelter, for family, friends, leisure time, and for those with whom we share those activities with. But as we contemplate these things, we realize that there are deeper things, more profound things, greater things for which to be thankful. Alfred Walton expressed this so powerfully in 
his writing, Recipe for Living, and I, I'd like to share that with you at this time. Some things a person must surely know if he is going to live and grow. He needs to know that life is more than what a person lays by in store. That more than all he may obtain, contentment offers greater gain. He needs to feel the thrill of earth, the strength of rest, and the joy of mirth. To know the pleasure that kindness brings and all the worth of little things. He needs to have an open mind, a friendly heart for all mankind, a trust of self without conceit, and strength to rise above defeat. He needs to have a zeal to share, a mind to dream, and a soul to dare, a purpose firm, a will to plod, a faith in others, and a trust in God. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, I've heard of his faith. That's what I might call positive gossip. He heard of their faith. And that's a wonderful testimony to the commitment of the Ephesian Christians. I've heard of your faith. Nothing greater could be said of someone, indeed of us as well. Are those in your community, in your circle, that have heard of your faith? One biblical scholar writes, Here is set out before us in perfect symmetry the characteristics of a true church. Paul has heard of their faith in Christ. The two things which must characterize any true church are loyalty to Christ and loyalty to people. The author goes on to say, We would do well to remember every now and then that the love of Christ and the love of others cannot exist without each other. Ours, you see, is a faith that's rooted in the cross, that central symbol of our faith. Rooted in a love of humanity expressed by Almighty God, expressed in the sending of His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself on Calvary for us. Ours is indeed a cross-shaped faith, a faith that unites us with God and unites us with each other as well. The Ephesian church seemed to be living out this faith in a particularly positive and powerful way. Here in this passage we see that Paul prays for a church which he loves. Paul loves this Ephesian church and a church which is doing well. And in the first century Palestine doing well meant something quite different than what we might think of in our 21st century. It didn't mean a massive building program, a, a, great, uh, a great programming or media success. No, it was far more profound and deeper and more spiritual than all that. Someone has said, the church is quite literally the hands to do Christ's work, feet to run on Christ's errands, a voice to speak His words. And so what did it mean for that church? It meant faithfulness to Christ and his kingdom. In these last two verses of the chapter, we have one of the greatest and most adventuresome and uplifting thoughts that anyone has ever had. In these verses, he calls the church by its greatest title, the body of Christ. We hear that phrase in scripture often, the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church, and the church itself is quite literally his body, his body in the world. And it is a body that's been called to a great mission, the building of the kingdom of God. And it was into this fractured world, a world torn by strife and division, war and prejudice, hate and violence, that the church was placed to begin that work of reconciliation, the work that Jesus came to do when he reconciled us to God. As someone said, it was Paul's thesis that Jesus died to bring all those various elements in this world into one, to wipe out the breaches of separation, to reconcile humanity, and to bring humanity to God. Jesus Christ was, above all things, God's instrument of reconciliation. And it was to bring all things and all people into one family and one unity that Christ died. And as Paul saw this being exhibited in the church of his day, 
Paul gave thanks and expressed an attitude of gratitude that all of us should have. Now when you think of gratitude, what comes to mind? How would you define gratitude? I think all of us might define it just a little differently. It seems that above all else, gratitude is an attitude of the heart. It's an inward disposition. Gratitude is saying thank you with an open and sincere heart. Thankful to others and especially thank you to God. Well, in a week from Thursday, many folks will sit down with their loved ones and return thanks for all of the blessings that they have. Sadly, as we know, Many others will not be able to do that this year. Time-honored traditions are being upended for so many of us. Perhaps this Thanksgiving with its demands for social distancing will give us time to pause and to reflect, to step back a little bit and on a far deeper level really truly understand what this holiday is all about. And yet there's so much we still are thankful for, isn't there? Thankfulness, true thankfulness, involves a cost. Psalm 50 said, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It costs something. Something is sacrificed in that thanksgiving. A sacrifice demands commitment. It demands a commitment to someone or something above and beyond us. And above our own needs and wants, desires, even opinions. It may mean letting go of our own agendas and trying really sincerely trying to see another person's point of view, even someone who may radically different, differ from us. And this is so critically important at this moment. That can be a very real sacrifice for some. Real sacrifice may mean giving when it seems well nigh impossible to give, even giving our love to those we may find impossible to love. Remember that account of the, of the widow with her might? She gave more than all the others because that widow gave all she had. Her giving was sacrificial, and she gave out of a sense of thankfulness. We have so much to give, but what we are called to give is more often something far more important than the material. It is a giving of the heart. You know, we can always drop a coin in a beggar's hat, but do we give of our presence to that beggar as well? In our cross-rooted faith, we are called to give to God our presence in worshiping and in worshiping him together and in fellowship and being present for one another as well. This is critically important in an age that is drowning in technology that in many ways brings us not closer together but even further apart. And it's especially challenging now when, because of the circumstances we're in, we can't meet together. It's very sad, it's very stressful, it's very distressing for people. But when we gather together, it's not simply to give thanks for turkey and trimmings, although we do that, don't we? To give thanks for gathered family and friends, to remember time-honored traditions. It is to remember that with November upon us, even with its shortening days and its colder nights, with snow on the mountaintops, the Lord is still present and still present with us. And even with pandemics and division and all the rest, God is still with us. We're reminded in this time of turkeys and tables and pilgrims and Indians, food and fun, not to forget the roots of what we cherish so dearly. These pilgrims came to our shores some 400 years ago this very year. They were not so absent-minded. They were very intentional about their commitment and their faith. They had a deep sense of call upon their lives individually and corporately. Let's just pause for a moment to, sing, to think of all that they had to endure that first Thanksgiving. They were exiled from their native land because of their deeply held religious convictions. They made that perilous journey across the North Atlantic in late autumn. They lost over half of their company in that journey. They were a band of individuals deeply committed to one another. Hunger, privation, and loss was with them every step of that long journey. And so what did they do? They returned thanks. They paused. They 
very deliberately set aside a day and a time in which to thank God for all that he had done for them. We give thanks over tables laden with foods the pilgrims never dreamt of. Our larders are full, our board is groaning, our homes safe and warm, and so we return thanks, as well we should. But we should also soberly, thoughtfully remember those who return thanks in circumstances far, far more reduced than ours. Their thanks, their attitude of gratitude was not based on the outward circumstances of their lives, but on that inner conviction that God had called them and that God was with them no matter what those outward circumstances might be. Paul in writing to the Philippians said, have no anxiety about anything but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We have so much anxiety today, don't we? Perhaps it's because we don't pause and bring those supplications and thanksgivings to God. Notice that threefold pattern here that Paul lays out. Number one, prayer, whatever the circumstances, whatever they might be at this moment, whatever the challenge or difficulty, we are called to be people of prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer, as the old hymn tells us. The second thing is supplication. Bring to God as a child would bring to any loving father. Ask again and again and again if necessary. And then place it and leave it with God. And number three, in all things thanksgiving. Give thanks in all circumstances. Because Paul says this is God's will. It is God's will for us to do so. This is not always easy and it takes some practice and spiritual discipline, but it's well, well worth it. Thanksgiving is a time of quiet reflection upon the past and an annual reminder that God has, again, ever been faithful. The solid and simple things of life are brought into clear focus, so much so that everything else fades into insignificance. Thanksgiving is a time for roots. It deepens them and strengthens them, making our trunks and limbs more secure in spite of the gales and the storms and difficulties that swirl around us. Someone said, the meal, the memories, the music Thanksgiving brings has a way of blocking out the gaunt giant of selfishness and ushering in the sincere spirit of gratitude, love, and genuine joy. Not a shallow, hollow joy, but a genuine, deep, spiritual joy. The pilgrims were people of prayer, and we should be as well. And prayer not only on that fourth Thursday of November, but every day as well. Now, were these pilgrims perfect people? No, most assuredly not. They did have their flaws, as we all do. But they were a people who zealously sought the will of God for their lives and the lives of their community. They knew that that level of commitment meant something. They endured what they did for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith as they wrote at that time. And that adventure, which began in England and moved across the channel to the Netherlands and eventually brought them to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, changed the world. And so 400 years later, we celebrate their courage and their commitment and their faith. A few crude hugs, uh, huts rather, hugging the shores of a cold and hostile continent, but with faith that endured, they triumphed. And they could certainly echo the words of Psalm 105, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, his love endures forever. As we speak about the pilgrim's attitude of gratitude, humility and praise, we need to commit ourselves to those attitudes as well. This is indeed a time of thanks. <clears throat> Perhaps we should also make a list like that song that we learned in Sunday school. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Do you remember that? Some of you, I'm sure do. Sound advice for all of us, no matter what our age. We need to count our blessings. We need to recall what God has done because God has done so much. He has invited us to be part of his family the body of Christ. None of us need to be alone 
because we're all part of the family. He's called us to a life of sacrificial service, of reaching out to others, because God has reached out to us in the love of Jesus Christ. May this Thanksgiving bring each of us a renewed sense of God's presence in our lives. And may others say of us what Paul said of the Ephesians. It is because I have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and your love to all of God's consecrated people that I never cease to give thanks for you and remember you in my prayers. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this yearly remembrance of who we are and where we've come from. And it gives us hope and assurance that we have a future because of you. Be with us through this Thanksgiving service. Give us grateful hearts and willing hands and feet. For we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. At this time, uh, Charlie will bring with us the uh, final hymn. Thank you. Thanksgiving, may the God who called us, the God who established us, and the God who sees us through be with you through this Thanksgiving season. Let's pray for his blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.